Heavenly Father, we uh, come to you this morning uh, thanking you that you, you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are our high King of Heaven. Uh, we pr help, pray that you would help us through your word to know you more fully today, uh, that we might delight in you more fully and rejoice in you more fully. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Will you please be seated? Well, for all the fathers uh, here this morning, uh, happy Father's Day. Uh, it's good to see you this morning. Uh, as, a, as a father of three, uh, I, I enjoy Father's Day. Uh, it's the one time of year where I feel like uh, my kids really, well, they always treat me well, but they treat me especially well on Father's Day. They say nice things to me like, uh, Dad, we love you. Uh, dad, thank you for being such a great dad. Uh, I even get things like, Dad, you're the best dad in the whole world, uh, which is always one of my favorites. Uh, and, and yet there's something about Father's Day that also kind of strikes me uh, in my conscience, uh, I have to confess, that uh, when, they, when they say things to me like that, uh, I'm always mindful of the fact that the, that the reality is, is that I'm, I'm, I'm not always a great dad. Uh, that there are times when I, I fall very far short of that. And, and at least two of my three kids, I think, are old enough now to, to know that I'm not always a great dad. Uh, they know that sometimes I get angry and uh, I, I say things that I shouldn't say. Uh, they know that sometimes I say I'm going to do something and something else comes up and I'm, I'm not able to follow through on what I, I said I would do. And, and so I think at least a couple of my children are in an age where whatever misguided thoughts they had about me uh, have now been put to rest. When was the first time that you realized that your parents were not perfect? be a shocking reality for some children. You know, someone and some people that they looked up to so significantly actually have some deep flaws. Or maybe you, you've idolized someone in your life and you've come to realize through some sort of event that happened that this, this person is imperfect. And you, and you think to yourself, I, I can't believe they did that. I, I didn't know that they were capable of doing that. Well, one of the things I love about the Bible uh, is that it's brutally honest. Uh, it does not allow you to go for very long idolizing someone other than God before it shows you uh, some of their deepest flaws. And that's what's going on here in this section of 1 Samuel. Uh, this, this is a, a warts and all kind of section of the Bible. I often think of Oliver Cromwell, you know, 17th century in England, and he had his portrait uh, done. and. Uh, and he, he, wanted, he wanted the warts on his face to be on that portrait, right? He didn't want anything to be hidden. He wanted it all to be out there. Well, the Bible's like that. It, it puts it all out there. And, and this section of 1 Samuel is a, is a warts and all kind of section. And so understand that what we're going to be seeing here today is how sin sneaks in. You know, where one moment we think that we've, uh, we've accomplished something good, we've resisted temptation, we're on top of the mountain, uh, I've shown myself to be righteous and, and faithful, and, and yet the next moment, sin seems to be pressing in on us, and we're in a dark valley with seemingly no way out. Okay, that's what we're going to see here in this section of 1 Samuel with David. And so up, up, up to this point in our study of 1 Samuel, you were beginning to think that David is just an absolutely perfect leader. I have bad news for you today because this passage here is going to correct you of that misperception. Because again, what we see is sin sneaking in and just kind of turning everything on its head. In fact, I think this whole section here in 1 Samuel, this is kind of a topsy-turvy kind of section. You know, where everything just seems, seems all mixed up. Up is down and down is up and, and everything kind of backwards and there's nothing quite what, uh, what we thought it would be. It's not looking like we thought it would be. It's not going where we thought it might go. And we see all of that in two stories that are, that are intertwined, two stories that deal with moments in the lives of David and Saul. Okay, now remember, Saul is the king on the throne of Israel at the moment, and David is the promised king of Israel to come. So let's look at this together. Uh, turn with me, uh, if you will, in your Bible or your bulletins to 1 Samuel chapters 27 through 29 this morning. Uh, by the way, if you're not used to, to reading uh, the Bible, there's lots of text before you today. Uh, just note that the small numbers that are printed throughout there, those are, the, those are the verse numbers, and those large bold numbers, those are the chapter numbers. 
Well, again, as we uh, turn to this long passage here today, we have two stories that have been intentionally intertwined. And so what we're going to see are, are, are two desperate men taking two desperate measures and experiencing two different outcomes. Okay, so that's, that's our outline. Two desperate men, two desperate measures, two different outcomes. And then after we look at those things, we're going to need to step back and ask the question, why? Why has the Bible intertwined these two stories? And, and it's at that point that we'll see there's some important application for us. But just to give you a hint of where we're going, uh, here's my prayer for us this morning. Uh, my prayer is that in a world that can often seem upside down and, and disappointing, my prayer is that we would see and believe that there, there is someone that we can look to. There is someone we can trust who really is absolutely good and absolutely perfect. Let's begin by observing these two desperate men. Uh, The two men, of course, are David and Saul, and and both of them find themselves in a situation where they are desperate. Uh, David has been relentlessly pursued by Saul. That's what we've been seeing for for many weeks now. And so he's, he's been constantly on the run. He's moving from one place to the next. He's really just trying to stay alive. And and you certainly get a sense of what's going on in David's heart with the opening verse of chapter 27, right? David thinks that he is going to perish one day at the hand of Saul, okay? So David David has realized, or concluded at least, that that Saul's never going to let him be, that that, that he's going to continue to pursue David until David is dead. Even though Saul has repented a couple of times, it's not really sticking. Saul is coming after David until David is dead, And then if you add to that reality the fact that David also has to worry about his men and his family, right? It's not just David who's on the run, it's his whole family who's on the run. And all of his men and their families, right? And all of it seems to be clearly taking its toll on David. And so David is desperate for help because, again, he thinks he's going to perish. Now, in one sense, when we look at David's desperation, we have to conclude that his assessment of the situation is completely wrong. Right? When David, David speaks to himself here and he says to himself in his own heart that he's going to perish at the hand of Saul, that is absolutely not true because God has told David otherwise. He's even shown David repeatedly that, that he will take care of him. Right? Back in chapter 23, Saul was just about to capture David when all of a sudden Saul's attack was, was diverted by the Philistines. This this miracle happened to free and save David. Or in chapter 24, when Saul was again pursuing David, God actually flipped the situation and put Saul at David's mercy in the cave of En Gedi. And then there was chapter 25, when Abigail reaffirmed the promise that we've heard time and, and time again from God to David, that God will protect David and one day place David on the throne. And so, uh, back in chapter 23, we were given a summary statement of the situation. That Saul sought David every day, but God did not give David into Saul's hand. Okay, that's the true reality. And David even expressed this just last week in chapter 26. uh, When he made the very clear statement that he wasn't going to kill Saul because he firmly believed that the Lord would take care of it. And that it would be Saul who would perish. Okay, that, that was the exact word he used of Saul. And yet here he is in the very next chapter, now taking that word perish and applying it to himself, thinking that he's done. There's no way out. He's going to die. And so the problem is that David, right, who once showed himself to be a great man of faith, is now no longer trusting God and is instead speaking words of unbelief to himself, telling himself that he has no hope. And friends, there's no way around that. Our great hero David is now acting out of unbelief. And yet, even as we acknowledge that, I also hope that we'd be able to sympathize a little bit with David here. I mean, this truly is a desperate situation. You know, we we may have enjoyed reading all these chapters that we've been working through for the last few weeks. I mean, they're kind of exciting. You've got lots of adventure. You got some thrilling escapes. You, you got you know, high action kind of scenes. 
Uh, this summer, I, I look forward to, to, to reading some easier books. Uh, I like to read some uh, Ian Rankin detective novels, and they're, they're lots of fun, right? He sets them in the, univer uh, at the, uh, in the city of Edinburgh, and, and you have characters who are running all over the place, and they're barely escaping. You have car chases and people running after each other, and it's a lot of fun to read, but if you're actually living that out, it's not nearly as much fun. Right? It's one thing to read and enjoy it. It's another thing to have to try and live through it, and David is living through it. So I hope we can at least sympathize a little bit here with David, that this is truly a difficult and desperate situation. You ever felt desperate? Do you feel perhaps desperate in your life, even right now? That life is so difficult. The obstacles seem so great that you have no idea how or even if you're going to get out of it. That's David. He's desperate. He's desperate for help. And he's not the only one who's desperate. And Saul, too, is a, is a desperate man. And specifically, Saul is a man who's desperate for guidance. Uh, at the beginning of chapter 28, uh, we, we learn that the, the Philistine forces are gathering for war once again against the Israelites. And, and then the scene shifts to Saul and, and his response to all that's going on. So look at chapter 28, verse 3. Now Samuel had died, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. Uh, a medium, kind of a fortune teller type person, a necromancer is someone who uh, communicates with the dead. Uh, it seems like an odd statement, but as we'll see as we work through this chapter, that it, there's a reason why we're being told this. Uh, verse 4, the Philistines assembled and came and encamped at Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel, and they encamped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. All right, one of the things that uh, we're repeatedly told about Saul in this chapter is that he's afraid. In fact, actually, we've seen that Saul throughout his life is, is, is very much afraid throughout most of his life. But here in chapter 28, his heart, we're told, is, is trembling greatly. And one of the reasons he's so afraid is because the Philistines are making a, a major attack against him and the Israelites. Where they, they've gathered their forces for war, we're told. Which isn't a terribly unique reality. I mean, the Israelites and the Philistines, are, they're, they're constantly at war. But you also get the sense that this battle is perhaps something more significant than usual. Because we're told in verse 4 that the Philistines have gathered at Shunem, right? which if, if, you, if you look at a map, you'll see that it's sort of in the middle of Israel, okay? which means that this is, this is a major military move by the Philistines to, to, to try and, and, and divide and conquer the Israelite army. So the Philistines are making a, a conquering kind of move here, and Saul is afraid. And what's particularly making this such a desperate situation for him is the fact that God is silent towards him. Right? Saul needs guidance. He's desperate for it. But he's not receiving any dreams. Neither does he have the Urim of the high priest because he killed all the priests. And there are no prophets around to communicate God's word to Saul because verse 3 reminds us that Samuel too has died. And so there's no word of God for Saul to receive so that he might have some sort of direction about what he's to do. It's actually tragic. Right? Saul has so often rejected the word of God throughout his life that he can no longer now even hear it. Like God is silent. Saul is desperate. And so we have these two very desperate men. David is desperate and Saul is desperate. And as a result, they both end up taking very desperate measures. Okay, if you go back to chapter 27, right? David's desperate measure is to seek refuge of all places with the Philistines. And, and not just with the Philistines, but actually in Gath, the hometown of Goliath, whom he killed. Now remember, David had previously gone there uh, and, he, and he ended up acting crazy in order to, to, to escape because it wasn't going well for him there in Gath. But this time, he's able to convince Achish, the king of Gath, that he's abandoned his Israelite identity so that Achish will embrace him. And if you, if you look at verse 2, the phrase there that David arose and went over, that, that, that's actually, that's, that, that's kind of a pregnant phrase, right? That's telling us something far more than just simple geography. 
Right? That's telling us that David, David has crossed a line that, that should not have been crossed. He's left Israel and he's gone over to the other side. And Achish embraces him. In fact, we're told Achish gave David and his men their, their own town in the country in which to live. And they lived there for 14 months. Okay, that's 14 months of them becoming more and more embedded within the culture of the Philistines. And apparently, 14 months of Achish growing ever more fond of David. I mean, and why not? You know, we learn beginning at verse 8 that David isn't just living a quiet life in his nice little country town. Now we learn that, in fact, David and his men have become raiders roaming throughout the land and are wiping out enemies and covering up their trail. Now it's possible, I suppose, that we might see what David is doing here as completing the conquest of the land of Canaan. And so we're told in verse 8 that those whom David and his men were fighting were the inhabitants of the land from of old. So in other words, they're the very ones whom God had instructed his people to remove from the land when they first entered it. And so I think in one sense, it's not incorrect to see that David is now doing that. He's, he's completing that mission, as it were. But then what David does is he goes back to Achish, and, and he lies to Achish so that Achish will think that David's actually been fighting the Israelites. Right, David comes back in, Achish says, where have you been today? Right, what, what, part, what land have you been raiding? And instead of David simply saying, I've gone and I've raided the Amalekites, he says, no, I've, I've, I've raided the Negev of, of, of Judah. Right? He makes it sound like he's been attacking the Israelites. But then, even more disturbing, in order to cover up his tracks so that the truth doesn't get back to Achish, we're told that he left no prisoners. He killed everyone. Right? I mean, dead men tell no tales. And so even though David, by doing this, he, he avoids formally be betraying his own people and killing them, he, he's nonetheless crossed a line. And so one commentator summarizes the situation this way. David was brilliant and successful in the way that he dealt with Achish, but he slaughtered whole communities and lied through his teeth to Achish in the process. He had left his principles in the mountains of Judah and boxed himself into a corner where deceit and ruthlessness were the staples that kept him alive. Right, that's, that's a desperate man taking desperate measures. And it ultimately puts him in a dilemma that seems impossible for him to get out of. Right, look, at, look at verse 1 of chapter 28. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against Israel. Okay, so the Philistines, they're, they're amassing their army to come and fight Israel. And Achish, who's a Philistine, said to David, understand that you and your men are to go out with me in the army. You're going to come fight with me against the Israelites. David said to Achish, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. Okay, so the Philistines are gathering for this, this major military offensive against Saul and the Israelites, and David is going to go out with the Philistines. And yes, it may be that his response in verse 2 is intentionally cryptic. Maybe it's intentionally cryptic. Yeah, yeah you, you, you know, you're going to see what I can do. Maybe it's intentionally cryptic. But either way, uh, we're, we're left with a cliffhanger. What will David do? Will he ultimately betray his people and fight against them? See, it's completely turned upside down. It's all messed up. Will David really do this? But before we can answer the question, which comes in chapter 29, the scene shifts to Saul. Because Saul, too, is a desperate man taking desperate measures. Look at chapter 28, verse 7. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek out for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. <clears throat> and his servant said to him, Behold, there is a medium at Endor. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night. And he said, Divine for me by a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. 
Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? He said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the wo woman said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, Do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming up out of the earth. He said to her, What is his appearance? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed with his face to the ground and paid homage. Then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me what I shall do. Okay, that's a desperate man taking a desperate measure. Right, the king of Israel. Saul is the king of Israel, and he's seeking a word of guidance from God through a witch. Now this story, it raises all sorts of questions that we don't have time to answer this morning. But, but notice a couple of details here. <clears throat> For one, notice that it's quite symbolic that Saul disguises himself by taking off his royal robes when he goes to meet this witch. And I think, think of something like Shakespeare's King Lear, right? And how, how Lear progressively divests himself of his royal clothing and, and thus with it as well his authority as king. Well, that's Saul. He's becoming less and less kingly by the moment. And then secondly, notice that even though Saul claims to be desiring a word from the Lord, that actually his contempt for the Lord is terrible. But not only does he, he go to seek guidance from a medium, which is a violation of God's law, but he he also swore in God's name that the medium would come to no harm. Right? You see, he's swearing in the Lord's name about how he will disobey the Lord's word. It's completely messed up. Now, again, I know there's lots of questions you probably have about this whole scene. I have lots of questions about this whole scene. But listen, if, if you're wondering, <clears throat> you know, is this whole witch medium thing real? And did she really bring Samuel up from the dead? And for that matter, thinking of life in the present, what do we make of things like Ouija boards and seances? I mean, are those things actually real as well? Well, friends, let me just say, right, the Bible doesn't command us to stay away from these things because they're fake. Right? Now, while many of them may indeed be fake, such that you know, many fortune-telling type people are essentially just performing parlor tricks, and again, the Bible doesn't command us to stay away from these things because, because they're not real. The Bible's clear. This is more than just a material world. It's not just the material that exists. There is a spiritual world that exists. And so, for example, 1 Corinthians 10 commands Christians to not participate in pagan worship because behind these things are demons, which is why the law of Moses prohibited mediums and spiritualists Quoting Leviticus 19, do not turn to a medium or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. And yet here's Saul doing just that. He's seeking guidance, but it's a, it's a, it's a desperate measure from a desperate man. Okay, so two desperate men, two desperate measures. But then what we see are two different outcomes. Okay, continuing with the story of Saul <clears throat> in chapter 28, look at verse 16. And Samuel said to Saul, Why then do you ask me, since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek, therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. Okay, so Samuel there, he repeats the judgment that God's already spoken to Saul about the kingdom being torn from him. But then Samuel adds a new word to that. He says that tomorrow Saul and his sons will be dead. They will have been killed by the Philistines in battle. 
And friends, the end of chapter 28 is a picture uh, of really of just a pathetic man who's, who's divested himself of his kingly robes, repeatedly disobeyed God's voice, and is now left obeying the voice of a witch. Look at verse 21. And the woman came to Saul, and when she saw that he was terrified, she said to him, Behold, your servant has obeyed you. I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to what you have said to me. Now, therefore, you also obey your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, urged him, and he listened to their words. So he arose from the earth and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fattened calf in the house, and she quickly killed it, and she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread of it, and she put it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they rose and went away that night. Right, that's what Saul has come to, right, needing to be cared for by a witch who requires his obedience. Now, what happened with David? <clears throat> I remember our, our cliffhanger. And remember, he's, he's already been summoned to go and fight with Achish against Saul and the Israelites. Right, but now, right, the cliffhanger is filled with even more suspense because we know that Saul and his sons are going to die in the battle that David is about to go and fight. So will David really be fighting in this battle and thus be at least partially responsible for Saul and Jonathan's death? Well, as we turn to chapter 29, <clears throat> what we see is that though David, like Saul, found himself in a desperate situation and thus took a desperate, sinful measure to try and get out of that situation, David's outcome, however, is mercifully different. So if you look at chapter 29, uh, all of the Philistine warlords are coming together to, to fight against Israel. And, and again, David, he, he's right there with them. But then all of a sudden, the other Philistine warlords, other than Achish, they, they see David there and they say to Achish, there's no way we're letting this guy go and fight with us in the battle. Right? He's the one who has killed tens and thousands of us. Right? There's, there's no way we're going to trust him to be loyal to us on the battlefield. Uh, Achish, he tries to defend David, in fact, three different times in this chapter. Achish affirms how innocent and blameless he thinks David is. Right, so much so that, that in verse 9, uh, Achish actually says to David, I know that you are as blameless in my sight as an angel of God. Uh, and, 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 and yet the Philistine commanders, they won't budge. They refuse to let David go. And so Achish has no choice but to send David home. And, and he does so against David's protests. I mean, amazingly, David, who you think would be kind of happy to have a way out of this dilemma, actually protests the matter. Look at verse 8. David said to Achish, but what have I done? Uh, what have you found in your servant from the day I entered your service until now that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? And David is protesting the situation. But by God's mercy, David is saved, even in spite of himself. David here is essentially saved from himself. Because listen, even if David's plan was to, to turn on the Philistines in the midst of the battle, right? if he's again sort of being intentionally cryptic there, that I'm going to go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king. Or maybe, he's, maybe he means Saul as his lord, the king. Maybe, maybe he means God as his lord, the king. Or maybe he means Achish as his lord, the king. Maybe, even if it's intentionally cryptic, it doesn't really matter because the fact that Saul was going to lose his life that day meant that there was no way David could even be on that battlefield and be seen to have any share in Saul's death. And so God mercifully, providentially, makes a way out for David from the difficult situation that he had put himself in. And so in these three chapters, we have two desperate men, <clears throat> excuse me, two desperate men, two desperate measures, but with two different outcomes. One man receives judgment, the other man receives mercy. And friends, I don't, I don't really have any explanation for that other than that God will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. It is his choice. But here's the question we need to ask. Why? Why has the Bible so intertwined these two stories? Because understand, chronologically, the events of chapter 28 with Saul there, th those, those events come after the events of chapter 29. 
Right? Chapter 28 is the very night before the big battle when Saul's told that he's going to die the next day. But everything that's taking place in 29 is happening before chapter 28. And so chronologically, it's out of, it's out of order. And then even just from a literary standpoint, chapter 28 breaks up the flow of the narrative in the story of David with the Philistines. So why? Why interconnect these two men in this particular way? Let me close by giving you two reasons, which are really two points of application. Okay, first, the intertwining of these two stories is meant to help us see that we should never put our ultimate hope and trust in any human leader. Listen to how uh, the commentator Dale Ralph Davis summarizes what's going on here. He says, the Bible does not claim that God's servants are dipped in Clorox, so they will be infallibly sin-free and attractive to you. The living God does not have clean material to work with. And don't get sentimental when you sing hymns about the potter and the clay. Remember, it's only sinful clay the potter works with. We should not criticize God the potter because of the clay, but rather marvel that he stoops to work with such stuff. As long as we wallow, however subtly, in some idea of human worthiness, we will never understand the Bible. Never tremble before this God and never delight in this God. We must get a grip on grace. Maybe a godless text can do that for us. Did you notice that? That this is a godless text with respect to David. David never talks about God in these chapters. Not once. He doesn't pray to God. He doesn't refer to God. He doesn't tell others about God. I mean, Agish, the king of Gath, speaks more about the Lord than David does in these chapters. And so the author of 1 Samuel is intertwining these two stories to say, David and Saul are not as different as you may like to think that they are. So don't think that you can simply demonize Saul and have nothing but admiration for David. David will let you down. He is not your ultimate savior. You know, we live in a, a politically charged environment right now. And some of you, you lodge your party and you demonize the other. And it goes both ways. And some of you lodge your candidate and demonize the other candidate. And it, and it goes both ways. Friends, how foolish that is. And not only how foolish, but how divisive that is in a church community. Why would you ever choose a political party or candidate over a brother and sister in Christ? It's foolish and divisive. Stop doing it. Because this passage here, the interconnection of these two stories is screaming at us, don't put your ultimate hope and trust in any human leader. And even as a parent, I have to say to my kids, I'm not your savior. I'm a sinful man who needs God's mercy in my life as much as you do. I, the only one we put our trust in is the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who is fully human and fully God and completely without sin. The only human ever without any sin because he's also fully God, born of the Holy Spirit. I think it's important that three different times in chapter 29, Achish, the Gentile Philistine ruler, declares David to be innocent and blameless. Now, Every time he says it, it's, it's dripping with irony. Because David's actually been lying to Achish this whole time, right? And we, the readers of the story, we, we know that. So it's, it's just dripping with irony. But why it's important and what it points to, you see, is, is Jesus and his genuine innocence. I mean, it's interesting that, that, that repeatedly Pilate... The, the Roman Gentile ruler stands up and he says of Jesus multiple times, he's innocent. I mean, it's almost as if the Bible is taking a big picture view here and saying, you need a leader who is completely innocent and pure and trustworthy. It's not David, but it is Jesus. He's the one you're longing for. He's the one you're looking for. He's the only one in whom we can put our hope and trust and know that he will never let us down. And then secondly and finally, the intertwining of these two stories is meant to remind us that we must not lose sight of who God is. 
Okay, the problem with both Saul and David is that they're not living in light of the truth of who God really is. And frankly, I'm not sure Saul ever really did. Uh, for Saul, God has, has always been much more just kind of like a genie in a bottle. Right? You, you, you rub the bottle, the genie comes out and, and gives you what you want. And, and that's, that's kind of how Saul treats God. And so when God doesn't give Saul what he wants, Saul just goes somewhere else to find it like a witch. And so Saul's never really shown himself to have an understanding of the living, creating God before whom he is entirely accountable for his life. But David has, at least up until now. So what happened? Well, friends, I think the author of 1 Samuel is showing us that like Saul, David here has lost sight of who God really is. And when he does so, it just, it just throws everything out of whack. Everything is out of whack here. Uh, David goes to God's enemy seeking help. Saul goes to a witch seeking help. David is praised by Achish. Saul is cared for and fed by a witch. Uh, David can inquire of the Lord, but he doesn't. Saul can't really inquire of the Lord anymore, but he tries. Uh, David doesn't ever talk about God, but Achish does. I mean, everything is just kind of, it's topsy-turvy. And the reason is because both men have lost sight of God. And friends, David's problem, it begins right there in chapter 27, verse 1. That's where his problem begins. Look at chapter 27, verse 1. David said in his heart, I shall perish. David said in his heart, I shall perish. Right, you see, the state of our heart is often shaped by what we say to our hearts. And where things went wrong for David is that what he began saying to his heart undermined his confidence in God. And it ran contrary to God's word. It ran contrary to God's promises. And it, it's revealing, I think, that David, David doesn't write any psalms, at least any that are recorded for us in the Bible, during this period of his life. Right? But when you read psalms from other periods of his life, what you find is he's, he's very often still talking to his heart. But at other times, he's affirming things that are true of God. Right, next time you read through the Psalms, you've got to pay attention to how often David starts preaching to himself about the truth of God. And other Psalms do this as well. Psalm 42 is a classic example. Uh, the psalmist says, talking to himself, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? And then he begins preaching to himself, Hope in God! For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. You see, he's, he's preaching to himself. And he's not saying to himself, you're going to perish, uh, uh, you have no hope. He's saying, no, hope in God. You know that God is your salvation. You know that, that God is your God. As you see, friends, that's what we have to do so that we don't lose sight of God. And we have to do it every morning. Really, I mean, every morning we have to get up and before, before all the other voices start coming at us, we have to preach to ourselves. We have to preach to ourselves about the goodness and the mercy and the love and the righteousness of God. And we have to preach to ourselves the, the good news of Jesus Christ, that he's loved us, he's died for us, he's risen for us. That he's our Lord. There's, there's no one like him. So what are you speaking to your heart? What are you most often telling your heart? Friends, put your hope in Jesus and preach the gospel to your heart every day. Amen?